All right, so thanks uh, for making time for this defense during a pandemic. Real quick, I just want to do a, a review of the dissertation, uh, kind of covering the quick highlights before we get into the discussion. Okay, so the dissertation is largely about reflective reasoning in philosophy and in psychology. So first I want to start by just considering the role of reflective reasoning in philosophy. So John Doris tells us that a preoccupation with reflection is arguably the Western philosophical tradition's most distinctive feature in both historical and contemporary contexts. And we're all familiar with what we mean uh, by reflection here. Uh, Christine Corzard gives us a kind of famous metaphorical description. We find ourselves with a powerful impulse to believe, but then we back up and bring that impulse into view, and then we have a cer certain distance. And now the impulse doesn't seem to dominate us, and we have this problem. Shall we believe? Well, unreflective judgments, sometimes called intuitions, are also standard fare in philosophy. Philosophers are often appealing to their intuitions when they're arguing for or against various views. As Hilary Kornblith puts it, George Beeler does it, Roger Chisholm does it a lot, and most philosophers do it openly and unapologetically, and the rest arguably do it too, although some of them would deny it. It turns out that unreflective and reflective judgments are hot topics in cognitive science as well, and because I study both philosophy and cognitive science, this means that reflective reasoning was a natural place uh, for me to conduct my research. So those who are familiar with dual process theory will probably think of reflection as a system two or type two cognition uh, in, uh, in the thinking fast and slow uh, vein from Kahneman and Tversky's research. And that's fine because reflection does seem to bear two paradigmatic features of type two cognition. Specifically, reflective reasoning is like type two cognition in that it's more conscious and more deliberate. And what I mean by conscious is not some sort of ineffable magic glow that, um, you know, will never solve a la the hard problem of consciousness. I'm referring to something observable here. So what I mean by when I say that reasoning is conscious is just that the content of reasoning is, to borrow a phrase of Dan Dennett, available at the personal level. So for example, conscious reasoning is probably articulable. So when we're reflecting about a problem, we can usually talk aloud about what we're thinking. So what do I mean by deliberate? I call our reasoning deliberate when we do not immediately accept or uh, accept our first automatic response, but rather reconsider it or consider an alternative. So this means that ballistic responses, which are responses that cannot be interrupted until they complete, are by def definition not reflective. So what is it that one's conscious of during reflection? In the paradigm cases of reflection, one is aware of the content of reasoning. So this content comes from various places, but it primarily comes from attention. We can attend directly to representations of what is currently being presented to us, or we can attend to representations that we've put into working memory, even though they're not currently being presented to us. And we can even attend to representations that are in long-term memory, uh, even though we haven't been presented with them recently. Now, to me, it's not clear that the content that we're consciously representing during reflection is the stuff of philosophy, such as propositions and logical inference and the like. I think reflection could easily be about something less intellectual than that many times. It's also not clear to me that reflection involves representation of oneself or self-reflection. So when we're reflecting, is P true? We need not be asking, do I believe that P is true? So uh, the model of reflection that I have in mind can be content agnostic, even if it's not agnostic about whether reflection involves consciously representation of some of the contents of reasoning. So reflection can be triggered in various ways, but even when reflection is triggered, reflection's mileage may vary. So I offer a view of reflection, a normative view of reflection called bounded reflectivism, uh, in which the utility of reflection depends on a few things, and I'm just going to skip to the one thing that I'll talk about in this overview, and that's what I call epistemic identity. And by epistemic identity, I mean the parts of our identity that entail holding certain beliefs. So identifying as an atheist uh, entails holding certain beliefs about the existence of God, and the same goes for identifying as a member of a political party or identifying as a proponent of a particular school of thought. So the idea is that we sometimes reflect in order to express or defend our epistemic identities 
rather than dispassionately and impartially find out an answer to a question. And when we reflect according to this kind of identity epistemology, reflection might not result in good judgment or decision making. Now, in my view, the solution to this problem of bad reflection because of epistemic identity is actually to embrace epistemic identity by appealing to shared superordinate epistemic identities. So, for instance, if two scientists are disagreeing about politics because they're both try trying to defend their own uh, political epistemic identities, then we might ask the two scientists not, uh, not what they think as members of each of their political parties, but what they think as scientists. And, you know, just anecdotally, you might think that this kind of strategy would work if you compare, say, how scientists discuss politics on Twitter versus how scientists discuss politics in their peer-reviewed publications about politics. So the implications of bounded reflectivism uh, involve a few things. So first, I'm, I'm accepting this idea that reflection is often crucial, but I'm not going as far as some philosophers to say that reflection is necessary or, or essential for good reasoning and action. But I'm also admitting that reflection can hinder uh, our reasoning. But again, I'm not going as far as some anti-reflectivists go in saying that reflection can't deliver any of the goods uh, that some philosophers have, have suggested that it can. And so this leads to um, a view that you might call strategic reflectivism based on uh, Bishop and Trout's strategic reliabilism. And the idea here is that we should deploy reflection in conditions when we know it's likely to lead to better judgment and action and potentially avoid uh, reflecting or at least relying on reflection when we're in conditions where reflection might lead to bad outcomes. So now I wanna move on to measuring reflection, which is uh, chapter three of the dissertation. So as many of you know, psychologists have developed tasks that can reveal whether people are relying on unreflective intuitions or more reflective judgments. And one of those tasks goes like this. If you're running a race and you pass the person in second place, what place would you be in now? So the answer that jumps to most people's mind in the studies that I run at least is first place. However, that answer is not quite right. If you think through the question a bit more, you might realize that the right answer is actually second place. So this verbal cognitive reflection test is taken to test reflection because it lures us towards a particular response that upon reflection we can realize is incorrect. So the good news is that uh, in studies that I've done since the dissertation, uh, I find that when we have people reason out loud as they complete reflection tests like this, and then we have independent people rate these think aloud recordings of their reflection test uh, reasoning, the more likely that uh, these independent raters think that these people are reasoning consciously and deliberately, the more likely those people work, were to come to the correct response on reflection tests. So all of this is to say that reflection tests do seem to track some sort of uh, consciousness and deliberateness of reasoning uh, in line with the two-factor account of reflection that I'm uh, developing in the dissertation. But there's some bad news as well. So the standard interpretation of reflection tests hold that, holds that all correct responses are supposed to be reflective and all lured responses are supposed to be unreflective. Um, uh, this, this does differ a bit from the two-factor uh, account of reflection I'm offering. And because I, uh, people can collect think aloud reports of people solving these tests, you can kind of determine whether or not they're deliberating, that is um, reconsidering their initial response or considering alternative responses. And if they're reasoning about all the, the contents of the problem aloud as they solve these tests to, to, to figure out if, if some people are coming to the correct response without reflecting, or if some people are coming to the lured response, even though they were reflecting, you could consider these like false positives and, and false negatives. And the studies, uh, I've, at least in one study I've done recently, around 20% of responses were false positive and around 30% of responses were false negatives, suggesting that we should probably reconsider our use and reliance and interpretation of reflection tests and it also suggests that using think aloud protocols would be a good way to identify problems with uh, the interpretation of reflection tests. So the next project I want to talk about is um, this project uh, that I've been doing for a while where I'm trying to predict philosophical differences from people's reflection test performance. There's a long literature of doing this with lay people, but I wanted to do it with philosophers. However, philosophers would often tell me when I mentioned this project, um, look, we philosophers, we're so reflective that there's just not going to be enough variance in our reflection test performance to predict variance in our philosophical beliefs. Uh, 
Well, at some point I realized that's an empirical question that should be tested, so I ran some studies. The first study found that philosophers' reflection test performance predicted beliefs about, predicted their philosophical beliefs about language, free will, God, morality, and personal identity. But I wanted to know if that was just a fluke or if that would replicate. And I also wanted to use some better reflection tests to control for some of the problems I just mentioned about reflection tests. So I pre-registered a replication and extension. And in that study, I found that most of the findings of the first study replicated and we found a few more things as well. This suggests that some of the links between reflection and philosophical beliefs that we find among lay people are also present in philosophers. So in the final chapter of the dissertation, um, I argue what this, this research about reflection might be able to tell us about implicit bias. And uh, this paper is now in uh, the journal Synthes. And in this paper, I argue that contrary to what we hear from some scholars, implicit bias is probably not entirely unconscious or involuntary. That is, it's not entirely unreflective. But contrary to some recent arguments from philosophers, it's also probably associative, even if it's not entirely associative. So um, this means that we can kind of categorize and I guess arbitrate various views of implicit bias. Here's a table distinguishing nine views of implicit bias according to how associative and how reflective they are. And I think that according to the best evidence, all of the views on the right, namely non-associative views of implicit bias are just not, not compatible with the best evidence that, uh, that I found as I was writing this. But uh, the middle column view, interactionist views, which involves uh, associative and non-associative views are somewhat compatible with the best evidence. But I found actually that the original associative view of implicit bias uh, was very well supported by the best evidence. However, I do admit before closing that paper that if, if I've overlooked evidence or if new evidence suggests that there are some non-associative processes involved in, in implicit bias, then we would have to revert to the middle column of views, uh, these, these interactionist views of implicit bias. So just to recap the broad conclusions, uh, I'm developing a two-factor account of ref uh, reflection according to which we can make observations to determine whether reasoning is deliberate or unconscious and therefore reflective. I offer a normative view of reflection called bounded reflectivism, which admits that uh, reflection can help or hurt depending on factors such as epistemic identity. Then I proceed to uh, consider the psychometric research on reflection and find some of the issues uh, with reflection tests might be solved by think aloud protocols developed by uh, Erickson and colleagues. In chapter four, I find that even philosophers' reflection test performance predicts some of their philosophical beliefs. And I do find that some of those correlations are better explained by other factors. However, some of those correlations uh, remain significant even after controlling for those other factors. And in the final chapter, I suggest that implicit bias and debiasing uh, implicit bias is probably not an entirely unreflective process, and it's probably associative, even if it's not entirely associative. But I'll open its questions. Mm -hmm.